Oh, yeah, deadlines never disappear, they just get very scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continuing with the product operator formalism. So, interesting things today. We will work out the way in which pretty much the entirety of modern magnetic resonance and a significant chunk of spin-based quantum technology actually works. We will learn to push magnetization from one spin to another. And this is a critical stage if you are dealing with multidimensional NMR experiments. It involves multiple nuclei. At some point you need to move the magnetization from this nucleus to the next in order to trace out the connectivity of the molecule. Likewise, if we are dealing with some quantum device, we need to take advantage of spin-spin interactions in order to evolve something in order to, for example, the sense to sense the applied magnetic field or gravitation uh, if we make that field location dependent and such things. So, let us begin where we began in the previous lecture. Let us once again derive the equation of motion for the observables and discuss it a little bit. So, item 1, equation of motion for observables. And, well, d by dt of some observable, and I'll call it O, and as you know in quantum mechanics, that's just the inner product of the two wave functions with the corresponding operator, or equivalently in the density matrix formalism, the trace of the product of the density matrix with the same operator. But let's do it from the Schrodinger quantum mechanics point of view. So we have the usual expression that you've seen many times by now, right? That is the definition of the observable quantity. If we, for example, have coordinate here, then that would be the corresponding coordinate operator, and that would give us the average coordinate of our particle. Here, the observable operator does not depend on time, so when we expand this triple product uh, using the product rule for differentiation, we will have a derivative of psi here, derivative of psi here, but that's just a constant for our purposes. So we would have d by dt of psi ra times o times psi ket plus psi bra times o times d by dt psi ket and brackets here and these are of course a Schrodinger's equation um, substitutions so we remember that d psi by dt was minus i h psi and so that is for the ket and the complex conjugate transpose are for the bra so we apply that d psi by dt is i psi h. So easy to demonstrate if you remember that the conjugate transpose of a product is the product of two conjugate transposes the other way around, so it flips around. So that's Schrodinger equation, that is its conjugate version, and we just plug that in. So we put that here and this there and we are going to have i then psi then h then o then again psi for the first term then minus i psi o h and then psi we take psi out of the bracket and see what is going to happen. i then psi and that gets us h o minus o h and then psi. Once again a commutator. So we recognize the commutator so that's i psi commutator h with o and then psi. And that is just the observable that corresponds to whatever operator this is. And so what we can conclude, just like we did last time when we did that with Liouville von Neumann's equation, that d by dt of the observable 
is the observable corresponding to the commutator of our operator with the system Hamiltonian. And this is an interesting observation because notice that the dynamics of every conceivable observable in the system is only a function of its commutator with the Hamiltonian. We eliminated wave functions from the formalism entirely or density matrices, or in fact any representation of the state. This goes to the foundations of quantum mechanics because a lot of spears have been broken over the years about what does the wave function really mean. What is the square root of probability? Uh, what's the significance? Can we visualize it? Does it have a meaning? And of course the existence of this equation implies that wave function isn't actually necessary in quantum mechanics and so all of those discussions might have been besides the point because some kind of artificial algebraic crutch that isn't even necessary probably doesn't have a physical meaning. So this is something to ponder. Uh, you know enough quantum mechanics by now to actually meaningfully ponder these things. Okay, so we have this equation of motion. And of course we do know what our Hamiltonians are, the Zeeman interactions, J couplings and so on. We know what our states are, they are all of those operators that we have discussed in the previous lectures, magnetizations, correlations, coherences and so on. And we put this to good use in the previous lecture to derive Bloch equations from basic principles, to get rotation diagrams for the operators, to discuss the spin echo and so on. So now let us discuss the second stage of that, and that is evolution under J couplings. So evolution under, well, only weak really. J coupling. The reason why we have to consider the weak one is the mathematics, if we do choose to treat the strong one, becomes horrendous. And really at that point it's much easier to use numerical methods on a computer. This weak J coupling gives enough insight into what is going on and enough of an inspiration to design a significant fraction of modern NMR pulse sequences. So, what we have is a Hamiltonian that is 2 pi j l z s z. So we have a two spin system, we have a j coupling between the two spins l and s, and we have this interaction term which we had discussed a few lectures ago. So let us now take a two spin system let us assume that our rotating frames are precisely on resonance with respect to both spins, say a carbon and a proton, and the only thing that we are evolving under in the rotating frame is this. And then we would like to know what happens to magnetization when such an evolution takes place. And for that, of course, we need to commute this Hamiltonian as per this equation here, with all three observables that we have and find out what is going to happen. All right, so let us begin with the longitudinal magnetization. And I will um, not put into commutators this trivial multiplier in front. I will just commute the operators and let's see what happens. So LZ SZ is what is proportional to our Hamiltonian. Let us commute it with LZ. Well, that is LZSZ times LZ on the first spin. And remember what a single operator means. It acts with a unit operator on the second spin. So there's actually in reality the unit matrix on the spin S here minus uh, the whole thing the other way around. Right, so we have LZ and the unit matrix on S times LZ SZ. Okay, so remember what I told you about the product operator formalism, right? Uh, it's an, a chronic product really here, it's an abbreviated notation for that. And so what we have is term by term, so LZ LZ gives us LZ squared 
then SZ times unit gives us SZ minus LZ LZ gives us LZ squared and then unit times SZ is just SZ so they cancel and it's a zero therefore the derivative is zero therefore longitudinal magnetization does not evolve under J coupling and so likewise we can say LZ SZ commutator with the longitudinal magnetization of the other spin in exactly the same way is zero okay so far so boring we do not have evolution of longitudinal magnetization under J coupling at least when the J coupling is weak let us consider the transverse terms and we would then have so transverse LZ SZ for example commuting with LX okay using the same um, tricks right uh, we can observe that since LX does not act on S we can just take S out of the bracket in here so this is really just LZ commutator LX and we have S Z in front right just like we would with integral differential operators if L and S operators act on different variables we can arbitrarily um, exchange them in the order that they act like for example derivatives with respect to different variables okay well we know the commutator of LZ and LX it's I L Y so it's I L Y S Z well now that gets interesting see what happens when we start with the transverse magnetization of the L spin what it does evolve into is a transverse correlation where the sign of the LY positive or negative will depend on the orientation of the second spin so because the system's interacting then the fate of the first spin becomes correlated with the state of the second spin uh, roughly speaking right since this J coupling is a product of Zeeman operators if SZ is positive then the magnetization will be rotating counterclockwise and if Z is negative it will be rotating clockwise right so the sign of the eventual magnetization will depend on the state of the partner spin so we have a correlated state and we can therefore write down the first equation of motion here we can say okay we've just computed d by dt lx so d by dt lx observable is i and then that commutator and not forgetting the 2 pi j here so we have 2 pi j this i and that i are going to give us a minus so we have minus 2 pi j and then this term here so the observable of l y s z okay that's our first equation of motion and right we now know that lx goes somewhere there where does this go so we need to calculate another commutator finding out the fate of this so this is like a chemical kinetics system if we start here it goes there if we start there it goes somewhere else let us find out where so taking that and doing exactly the same thing so we now need to commute it with the Hamiltonian so the commutator of LZSZ but now with LYSZ well, it's quite some exercise here we are going to have L Z S Z L Y S Z minus L Y 
SZ and then LZSZ. All L operators commute with all S operators. They act on different degrees of freedom. So we can push all the L's to the left and all the S's to the right. So L, Z, L, Y, then minus L, Y, L, Z, and S, Z squared we take out of the bracket. This is a commutator of L, Z with L, Y minus I, L, X minus i lx sz squared and let's think about what this sz squared is we will now specifically restrict our attention to spin halves uh, unfortunately at this point the dynamics become spin dependent but typically such experiments are conducted on spin half particles so sz squared one half zero zero minus one half squared is of course a quarter zero zero a quarter which is just one over four times the unit operator nice and simple so only for spin half this is minus i over four l x now okay so we can see that l x evolves into LYSZ, but LYSZ evolves back into LX. So it's still a two-dimensional rotational dynamics of some kind, except now this is no longer a physically visualizable space. Yesterday, in the previous lecture, we were having LX rotating into LY, and this is something we can visualize. Here, Lx rotates into some complicated correlated state. Hard to say what it is. The dynamics is high dimensional, um, no visualizations in 3D, but still it is rotational and we can understand it mathematically. So what we have here therefore is likewise d by dt ly s z is minus i and i so minus i from there and i from here give us a plus then we have the quarter and so it's not 2 pi j it's pi j over 2 over 2 and then that's lx and you can kind of see the emerging rotational dynamics, right? The derivative of a cos is minus sine. The derivative of a sine is plus cos. But the frequencies are different, right? That's a bit of a problem. And so if you draw this, this is actually an ellipse. And we need to do a little bit of mathematical massaging here to turn it into a circle. Let's think what we can do. If I take this two, and I steal it and I put it inside the observable. Then this two would disappear and I have a pi j. If I take that two and I do exactly the same, I steal it from here and I put it inside the observable here, then we would also have a pi j here. This is related to operator normalizations on Hilbert spaces. We do not have the time in an undergraduate chemistry module <laughs> to deal with operator spaces. Um, for us now it's just a trick to get the equations into the perfectly uh, rotational dynamics rather than the ellipsoidal, uh, but it has a deeper meaning um, elsewhere in quantum mechanics. So we rewrite this in the following way. We say d by dt lx is minus pi j times 2 ly s z and d by dt 2 ly s z is pi j lx. So with respect to these observables and I mean who cares right if that's some kind of angular momentum if we just call it twice the angular momentum doesn't really matter but now we have the same frequency and now this really is a sine and a cosine and easily solved right if we start our dynamics precisely in LX then it 
immediately follows. I will not bore you with solving the, the system of ODEs, but LX of T, so no brackets uh, here using the chemists and biologists notation, will be cos pi j t, so rotating with this frequency with a cos, and then 2 L y s z of t will be the sign. And we can now make exactly the same rotational diagram as we had for the longitudinal and transverse magnetization in the previous lecture. We can say, okay, our evolution operator is 2LZSZ. So this stolen 2 remains here. And where did we put the Hamiltonian so that the frequency is pi j? And so that is the operator under which the evolution happens. And if we start with Lx, as per the dynamics here, it rotates into 2LYSZ. So an arrow goes there from which we are going to rotate into minus Lx, from which we go into minus 2 L Y S Z, and thereafter back. So that is an evolution diagram that is similar to what we had in the previous lecture, but it is under J coupling. Likewise, and we will need it in a moment, if we repeat this entire process, for the dynamics which begins with Ly rather than Lx, we are going to have the second important diagram. So again, the dynamics is under 2LzSZ. And if we start with Ly, it rotates into minus 2LxSZ and then back into minus Ly and then back into 2 Lx S Z and then returns into L Y. Okay, so far so obscure. You can see that under the influence of spin-spin couplings, magnetization evolves into a correlated state. Let us now put that to good use and um, introduce a way to transfer magnetization using these methods. So item three is magnetization transfer. Consider the following sequence of radio frequency pulses. Let's say we have, well, spin L could be protons, usually R, and then spin S. In typical protein NMR spectroscopy, this would be nitrogen 15. And the reason why magnetization transfer is necessary is, think about nitrogen 15. The magnetogyric ratio is 10 times weaker than the protons, so even the initial magnetization is 10 times lower. Then the detection sensitivity will also be 10 times lower because there's 10 times less magnetization. And uh, in electrical circuits, the sensitivity also is a function of frequency, and for that reason the sensitivity would be low. And of course, natural abundance is horrible, so isotope labeling is needed. But on protons, the magnetization is relatively abundant. 100% natural abundance, high magnetogyric ratio, quite convenient electronics. It's in the sweet spot of the sensitivity in um, modern magnets. So it makes sense to only ever detect protons, but it, we do require the magnetization to pass through the nitrogen in order to map the, for example, protein backbone connectivity. So what we are going to do is we will give our protons a 90 degrees pulse, so pi by 2 in the y phase, then we will wait for a certain period tau, we will give another 90 degrees pulse, and that would have a phase x. And at the same time, we will instruct the transmitter on the nitrogen to give us a 90 degrees on nitrogen, so pi by 2 
in the Y phase and then after a period of another tau and we will figure out what that needs to be another 90 degrees and this one is pi by 2 x as well so far it's not terribly clear what is going on here but let us try and find out using our product operator formalism and what I will also do is I will reproduce the rotational diagrams from the previous lecture because we will now need to refer to them so remember that under L Z if we had the X magnetization it was rotating into Y and so on so we have LX into LY into minus LX into minus LY and back into LX and we have both the X and the Y pulses there so let us also put the diagram under LX so if we start okay if we are rotating around LX if we start at LY then it will go uh, LY will go into LZ that will go into minus ly and that will go into minus lz and then back and likewise under ly and that rotation takes the z and moves it on to x and then into minus lz then into minus lx and then back okay so this was derived in the previous lecture fine let us begin with the longitudinal magnetization of the L spin. So L Z. Say our protons. And we have a ton of this. We give it a 90 degrees with the Y phase in the rotating frame. We are rotating around LY by 90 degrees. LZ evolves into LX. So pi by 2 in the y phase we get the lx all right great we are now transverse we assume that we are on resonance so there are there is no zeeman evolution but now the evolution happens under the j coupling like we have just discussed and if we evolve it for tau then we have to look at these diagrams we are in lx so we are here Therefore, we're evolving into Lx cos pi j tau as per the solutions that I have written there. So literally cos. And we are slowly rotating ourselves into a two-spin order. So plus 2Ly Sz sine pi j tau. The clever magnetic resonance spectroscopists pick this interval such that the cosine goes to zero. So we say this tau will be such that pi j tau is pi by 2. So this is actually 1 over 2 j. Say we have a 140 hertz coupling between the proton and the carbon or a 50 hertz coupling between the proton and the nitrogen in the peptide bond. So this will be 100 in here. So if that's exactly 10 milliseconds, then we will be purely, so tau equals 1 over 2j, in the 2LYSZ state. Okay we have done half of what is necessary we have taken the starting magnetization here and we have evolved it into a two spin order our mission now is that we've engaged the spin s to withdraw from the spin l so that we have a pure s magnetization in the system well this is what these two pulses are for let's think about them pi over 2 in the x polarization on l so pi over 2 with respect to spin L in the X phase. We are in LY and that means we are here evolving under X 
for pi by 2. That will become Lz. So, 2Lz. What about S? We've got the pi by 2 in the y polarization on S. S was in Z under y from Z 90 degrees Sx. See what happened. Previously the L spin was transverse and S was longitudinal. Now the L spin is longitudinal and S is transverse. Let us give it another period tau. Okay, so tau. We now need to use these diagrams again, but notice it's the S spin that's transverse and L that's longitudinal. So the, we need the copies of these diagrams with just switched labels on these spins. So we have a Zx state which is here and we have a two spin order and zx state evolves into the y state on whichever spin had been transverse so in our case the s is now transverse so we will get into s y we have s y well look we've pushed the magnetization from l into s and then the final pulse on s this is actually optional and might not be necessary in all cases pi by 2 in the x phase so x phase if we start with the y magnetization 90 degrees we rotate into the z magnetization so pi by 2 x we will get uh, into s z excellent so this is called magnetization transfer Right, we have taken a state of a spin and we moved it to a different spin. Now this of course has been known since about 50s in magnetic resonance, uh, but recently a bunch of clowns who were pretending to do uh, NMR quantum computing have renamed it into quantum teleportation. So a fancy name of course, but substantially exactly the same thing. You do take a state of a particular particle and you use the interparticle interaction to move that state over to the interaction partner. Okay, now let us generalize this a little bit. Notice that we have assumed that none of these processes have Lama precession in them. But of course, in a practical experiment, okay, we can put the transmitter and the rotating frame precisely on resonance with respect to one spin, but in a protein there will be a ton of those spins with different chemical shifts. And so it's unavoidable that we should have some offsets and some Zeeman interaction present. And this pulse sequence is quite sensitive to Zeeman interactions. If we start getting additional phases here that come from Larmor precession, then this will break the trigonometric relations that neatly lead us to the SZ. And so we need to modify this magnetization transfer sequence to take that into account. And how do we get rid of unpredictable Zeeman offset distributions? Spin echoes. So we modify the sequence. And let's think about where we need to stick those echoes here. That is a period of free evolution, and that is a period of free evolution. And if we put the pi pulses, perhaps here and here, what is going to happen is anything other than the interaction will get itself refocused, and we will effectively have the same dynamics. So let us update our pulse sequence to take into account the fact that we have chemical shifts in the system too. Okay, same diagram. So we have spin L and spin S. Then we do get the 90 degrees pi by 2 on Y, I think the original one was. Okay, so then we wait for a period, but the period is tau over 2. 
and then we put here a 180 pulse. It's a bit wider, so pi. And the phase of that, if this is y, then this creates the x magnetization, and so a good phase for this is x. It will simply rotate us around the axis, and then it will recollect it exactly the same diagram as we had in the lecture when we dealt with the spin echo. But of course, what we do want to happen as well is, although the spin, sp spin precession needs to be refocused, the coupling needs to go on. But if we do just that pi, what we will do unintentionally is we will flip the sign of the L spin and therefore effectively the sign of the interaction. And so the interaction will work itself backwards, which is not a good idea because it will undo itself. So what we also need to do is we need to flip the S spin at the same time. So pi, and it doesn't really matter which phase is in there, so pi x. Then what's going to happen? S was longitudinal up to this point, it will stay longitudinal, it will just point down. L will get itself refocused, but at the same time, even though the L flips the sign, S also flips the sign, and so the interaction keeps going right, with the same sign. And then we have another interval of tau over 2, there as well as there. And we arrive to these two pulses that deal with our two spin order. So switch which spin is longitudinal and which is transverse. So we get that. And the phases are pi by 2x and then pi by 2y here. Exactly the same story once again. We are entering the next evolution period we need to break it in half and put the pi pulses there. So now we have this evolution time, so tau by 2 and then tau by 2 there. We need once again two pulses. This time we refocus the Zeeman interactions on the spin S because spin S is transverse in this case and L is longitudinal. This pi pulse is designed to do a spin echo and that one is designed to keep the J coupling going in the same direction. So this is pi X and that is also pi X and after another period of tau over 2, so 1 over 4j, tau over 2, we get the final pulse of that original pulse sequence there, so pi by 2 with the x phase. And so what goes into this sequence is Lz, so goes into, and what comes out of this sequence is S Z. We have pushed all magnetization from one spin to the next. And if you look at a lot of modern NMR experiments, this stage is ubiquitous. And it has a somewhat silly name. The original use for this was to increase the sensitivity. Say we are on carbon-13. We've got only a quarter of the magnetization and it really helps if it's a metal group, for example, to push all the proton magnetization over to the carbon and then the sensitivity will increase. So the original name for this uh, is insensitive nuclei enhanced by polarization transfer, uh, inept. Uh, invented uh, in this country, uh, Garris Morris, who you might meet at conferences, uh, if you go to NMR conferences. Uh, and uh, I think this started a tradition of silly abbreviations in magnetic resonance. So we've got nosy, cozy, foxy, toxy, sleazy, sexy, and, and so on. If you look through the NMR literature, uh, the 
you know, driving force behind that, of course, is SY, is the abbreviation for spectroscopy. And there's also the, the two ending letters for a lot of words in the English language. And so one can be quite creative about abbreviations if you're doing spectroscopy. So um, check out in the MA literature, you will see a lot of silly abbreviations. I mean, like literally dozens of them. Okay. Finally, what I want to mention is this entire process works in the presence of any number of spins which are not interacting with the system in question. Of course, exactly the same relations that we have seen and discussed multiple times already. If we have A cron, B cron, however many spins we have there, times C cron, D cron, however many spins um, there are, then that is A C cron, B D cron, whatever else there is. And so if all the other spins have unit density matrices, so we do not impose any particular state on them, then these unit states are just trailing through this entire mathematics and not influence anything because we are just multiplying together a bunch of unit matrices. And so this can be applied not just to a two-spin system, but any sufficiently isolated two-spin subsystem of a bigger system. Likewise, even if the outside world is interacting with us somehow, notice how we neatly got rid of that by putting in the pi pulses. So a suitable number of pi pulses on either the system itself or in fact on the outside world would refocus those interactions and allow us to perform these sorts of tricks. Um, well, on just about any liquid state in a mass spin system. Okay, so the topic of the next lecture after the Easter break will be protein and mass spectroscopy and how we take the amide protons, move the magnetization over to the amide nitrogen, from there to the carboxylic carbon, from there to the C-alpha carbon, from there to the C-alpha proton, and thereby trace out the protein backbone connectivity. And this is how hundreds of protein structures per year are determined with nuclear magnetic resonance. So this was the formal mathematics and quantum mechanics of how that happens. And from the next lecture, we will start with biological applications. Right, any questions?